All right. Um, so before I start talking about Locke, are there any questions about the syllabus or the assignments or anything like that? Oh, okay. Um, so I said, I guess not much about Locke's biography last time. I will say, not much more about it now, but a little bit. Oh, 1632, 1704. Um, so, uh, oh, by the way, so actually, before I start talking about that, I should mention um, that uh, both TAs are going to have office hours. Yeah. Uh, no, they're, they're both going to have office hours at a fixed time. I believe Enoch's are going to be via Zoom and Chelsea's are going to be via Zoom or if you make an appointment in advance, she could do it in person. Um, and uh, I guess when I have all the information about that together, I will send out an email and also put the, that information on the syllabus. I haven't fixed my own office hours yet, but I will soon, I guess. Okay. And someone said, is the first ME based on the first reading? Or all reading to Wednesday. The first ME is based on uh, the first ME is. Do Wednesday, April 10th. And so that means it will be on the reading up through Monday. Right? The, the ME is always about the reading that, like, first there's reading, and then I have a lecture about the reading, and then the ME will be due after that. Um, so, um, just a little bit about Locke's life. Um, he studied medicine at Oxford, um, and uh, he pra actually practiced medicine for a while after he left Oxford. Um, he was also, while he was there, he was involved in this kind of group of uh, people who uh, call themselves experimental philosophers, right? But we would call them scientists, um, uh, centered around Boyle and Hook, right? Boyle and Hook both have laws after name, named after them, so Boyle's law and Hook's law, so you know they're important. Uh, Locke was not a central member of that group. I think he was kind of a young hanger on, but uh, he did he did have some real connection to the empirical science of his time. Um, and so in particular, like when he talks about what it's like to do chemistry experiments at some points, I think he's speaking from experience. Um, um, now, later on, he uh, started working for Anthony Ashley Cooper, who was the first Earl of Shaftesbury. 
Um, at first, he worked for him as a physician, and I guess he like uh, saved his life when he had a liver infection or something like that. Anyway, um, but later he worked for him as his secretary. Um, and um, right, he was the first Earl of Shaftesbury. His grandson was the famous philosopher of Shaftesbury, the third Earl of Shaftesbury. First, the uh, first Earl of Shaftesbury was a powerful and controversial figure in this period. Um, so two things about him. First of all, he was one of the Lord's proprietor of the colony of Carolina. Right, so the colony of Carolina was uh, founded under during the reign of Charles II. That's why it was called Carolina, um, and uh, and it was uh, set up to be controlled by this small group of lords proprietor. Um, and because of that, Locke ended up uh, working also for the lords proprietor of Carolina, and among other things, he. Uh, wrote a constitution for the colony of Carolina, um, a constitution that was uh, never actually adopted and probably couldn't have been. It was kind of bizarre, but um, but, uh, but notoriously that con that constitution does uh, involve slavery. Right, it was a slave colony that was being founded. Although I think at that time they didn't realize quite how important uh, black slavery was going to be to their colony. They, I mean, I think there was still actually, at the time Locke wrote that, there wasn't much there on the ground in Carolina, kind of a projected colony. Um, uh, so, I, you know, this is something I alluded to or discussed briefly last time. And again, I'll say that if you want to hear more about that, you can take uh, Bill 144 next time I teach it, whenever that might be, and I will talk more about it there. Um, the other thing about Shaftesbury is, so like he started off as a favorite of Charles II, um, but uh, then he had a falling out with him, and he uh, eventually became one of the founders of the Whig Party, that is, roughly speaking, the anti-loyalist party. Um, Josephine says, wait, that's really wild. What's really wild? <laughs> I, I just didn't know that he was a favorite of Charles II. It's like if it's like if you told me that um, I don't know that someone had been best friends with Mussolini and then later become a rabbi. That's just like a crazy change of behavior to go from friends with Charles II to Whig. Yeah. Well. Um... I guess it's not that wild when you read about it. But so, but by the way, I should make it clear, I'm talking about Shaftesbury here, not about Locke, although Locke followed Shaftesbury, right? Because right? Locke was working for Shaftesbury. Um, and I think Locke probably, so like that constitution he wrote for Carolina, like it actually only mentions black slavery in a couple places in a weird way. But a big part of it is about, all of it basically is about establishing a new stable form of feudalism including serfs and like everything. <laughs> so I'm pretty sure Locke never believed in that. <laughs> um, he, but so I think that probably the later Whig version of Shaftesbury was closer to Locke's actual beliefs, but you know, it's hard to know. Anyway, um, uh, so, uh, Right, in the run-up to the revolution of 1688, the glorious revolution. Um, so what happened was, so Charles II was suspected of being secretly Catholic and wanting to bring the, the uh, kingdom back into Catholicism. Um, and his successor, James II, was even more strongly suspected of that. 
Now, I, I think we actually now know that, I'm not sure about Charles, at least that he would have had Catholic sympathies and that James II definitely really was secretly Catholic. Whether they really had sinister plans to bring the, to make the whole country Catholic, I think is a lot less clear. But uh, so, I mean, uh, the revolution of 1688 was about like, um, preventing this Catholic plot. And so they deposed James II and replaced him with William, William and Mary. Um, William, Prince of Orange, became uh, um, William the Second, I guess, because William the First was William the Conqueror. And if uh, current Prince William. Uh, I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> why that? So, uh, so that William was William the Third. What he would be? Yeah, he would be the William the Third. Third. William Rufus was William the Second. He got shot for being gay in like eleven hundred. Oh, oh. So this William was William the Third. Oh, okay. Maybe that's right. Um. Okay. Anyway, never mind that. <laughs> So, um, so in the run up to the revolution of 1688, um, Locke and Shaftesbury were both prominent on this ant, this Whig anti king side. And uh, eventually they had to flee to Amsterdam. Uh, Locke, in particular, was suspected of being involved in a plot to assassinate Charles II. Um, yet I think that. Um, I think historians mostly think he wasn't actually involved, but he certainly knew people who were. <laughs> so anyway, he uh, he had to flee to Amsterdam and he didn't return to England until after the Whig side won in 1689. So he was in Amsterdam from 1683 to 1689. Um, and when he came back, he published uh, in 1689 his two most important works, so one of them is the essay concerning human understanding that we're reading in this course, and the other is the two treatises on government, that, um, especially the second treatise, which we read uh, a lot of when I teach 144. Um, so that's when they were published. They were, of course, mostly, they weren't all written in 1689. They were some, they were a lot of them, a big part of it was probably written in Amsterdam and some parts uh, even before that. Um, anything else I want to say about that? I think. Um, There is some overlap between what the two books discuss, um, and we're going to read part of it. So we're going to be seeing some of the things that Locke says about ethics and politics in the essay. It's actually, uh, even though they were published at the exact same time, it's actually can be a little bit difficult to reconcile them with each other. <laughs> um, so I may mention that somewhat when we get to it. Um, all right, um, that is all I have to say about real life luck before I start talking about the book. Are there questions about that? William Rufus was the conqueror's son. Oh, okay, William III and Mary II. Do queens get numbers if they're not reigning queens? I don't know. That's very pedantic historical thing, but she was a reigning a reigning queen. Um, it's the only time England has had two simultaneous monarchs. Anyway, okay, what I actually wanted on. to ask, yes. you mentioned <laughs> this book and one other that we're going to look at in comparison. What's the title of the other one? No, I'm saying we're not looking at the other one, but the, oh. the other one is, is the one I teach in political philosophy, 144, the second treatise on government. I That's, mean, thank you. I, wanted to, there were two I just needed that title. Yeah, okay. Um, there are two treatises, but the first one is, well, never mind. Anyway, <laughs> um, 
Okay. Are there other questions about that? There are, you should probably ask Josephine. <laughs> okay, anyway. Um, so, uh, uh, let me start talking about this book. Now, but before I talk about the um, details of this book, I'm gonna introduce this distinction between propositions and ideas. Now, for those people who are also in 106, this is essentially the exact same distinction between judgments and concepts that I was just talking about at the end of the 106 lecture. Um, so, um, so a proposition is, um, well, so according to Locke, propositions in the primary sense are something mental, right? There's something we do in our mind. But uh, they're the kind of thing that would be expressed in language by a sentence. And the kind of sentence that, the model kind of sentence that um, everyone from Aristotle to, well, after Kant at some point, anyway, the model sentence, sentence that everyone is thinking of has this form here. S is P, right? Where S is the subject and P is the predicate. So an example of a proposition would be gold is yellow. That is, again, the, the real proposition in a primary sense is the thought that gold is yellow. <laughs> but then you can call the written or spoken sentence the proposition a proposition because it expresses that kind of mental proposition. We'll, we'll talk later about how Locke thinks that um, mental things are related to language. Um, but so, but I'm mentioning that because um, I just I know from experience this is a can be a difficult thing to understand, although I'm not sure I know why it's a difficult thing to understand. <laughs> I have some thoughts, but anyway, but I thought like just note, keeping in mind that a proposition is the kind of thing that would be expressed by a sentence, a sentence like this. Okay, so what's an idea? So according to Locke, propositions are contain ideas. And these would be examples of ideas. Or the words that S and P stand for here would be words that express ideas, <laughs> right? So if an example of this would be, all gold is yellow. Examples of ideas might be gold and yellow. Okay. Um, right. So some would say, I feel like I'm going to need my fill nine notes, but mm -hmm. I don't know what they teach in fill nine, but I I don't know that they teach Aristotelian logic in fill, fill nine. <laughs> you need your notes from the logic course that we don't have on Aristotelian logic. <laughs> right. So, um, Right, so, but this is all we need of it for now, and perhaps all we need of it, period. That a proposition looks like this, and a proposition contains ideas. The terms of the proposition express ideas. <clears throat> terms meaning like the two ends of the proposition around the copula is. Okay, so um, keeping this distinction in mind, unless, are there questions about it before I go on?
All gold is yellow is a proposition that Locke is going to discuss early on. Um, well, at least. No, never mind. Anyway, it's, it's an example that um, is relevant to Locke. <laughs> um, okay, so. Um, so the the overall purpose of this book is to ask on what basis does our knowledge rest? And therefore, what are the limits of our possible knowledge? Um, where knowledge um, is or involves a kind of proposition. Right, so our knowledge, the kind of thing we can know is, for example, that all gold is yellow. In particular, although he sometimes uses the term more loosely, uh, when he's talking strictly, Locke um, calls our um, assent to a proposition knowledge when it involves absolute certainty. So it's a pretty strict definition of knowledge, actually. And not surprisingly, the limits of our knowledge are going to turn out to be fairly narrow. <laughs> um, he also, in the book, discusses the basis of our judgments of probability or rational beliefs. And that's going to be a much larger range. But the truth is, Although he discusses both, he seems to be most most interested in knowledge, strictly speaking. Okay, and again, so the important thing about this distinction here is that knowledge is going to consist of propositions. Now, I mean, you already know from the title of the course what Locke's basic answer to the question, what is the basis of all our knowledge is, namely, experience, right? He's an empiricist. So basically, the answer is going to be that all our knowledge is based on experience. As we'll see, there's Locke is not actually the most radical empiricist you could be. There's a sense in which he thinks some of our knowledge is not based on experience. Um, but um, um, but the sense is, is tricky, and I'll talk about it when we get to it. But so in any case, this is that's the basic answer to the question. Where does, where does our knowledge come from? What is it based on? Answer, experience. And so um, the competitor the competing answer that he considers is that all our answer, all knowledge is based on innate principles. So this is like, as opposed to empiricism, which is Locke's view, right? So Locke is an empiricist, and but he takes himself to be arguing mostly against an opponent who proposes, and instead of experience, that all our knowledge is based on innate principles. Meaning uh, that there's certain truths that we're born, born knowing and we always know, number one. And number two, that those truths are principles, which means, um, so like the phrase, first principle is actually redundant. Principle means first, <laughs> right? So like that our knowledge that there's innate principles means that there's things that we're born knowing that are the principles from which we can get the rest of our knowledge. Now, um, meaning, that we're born knowing them and we always know them, what does that mean exactly? So, I mean, Locke is going to interrogate that and kind of tear it to pieces. <laughs> but, um, um, but 
um, in some sense, we always know these things would be the theory. Yes, Matt. So are any principles the same as a priori uh, <laughs> assumptions, basically? Well, um, <laughs> no. So as I just said in the 106 lecture, a, a priori, the way Kant used it, does not mean innate. Um, um, and uh, I mean, that's one way of seeing what I was about to say, which is that it's not clear that innate principles is the only competitor available for empiricism. It's the one that Locke argues with. I'm not even sure if anyone is, it's not clear who he has in mind. I'm not sure if anyone would be rightly interpreted as holding exactly the view that he's arguing against. Um, but yeah, certainly what Kant calls a priori knowledge is not innate because Kant says, uh, we don't know anything until experience awakens the mind and blah, blah, blah. So, right? so we're not born knowing things. And also another mark, he, the Locke uses the term faculties, and I believe he uses it in the uh, sense of like sensory organs, like things that can perceive and sense. All right, I'm going to talk about what faculty means. It, okay. Faculty means power, basically, but I'll, I'll say more about exactly what uh, faculty means. Yeah. Yes, just uh, Is what I had in mind when I was was reading about like innate principles is that um, is it the same view that is expressed although people don't agree if Plato actually believed it in the one the platonic dialogue where Socrates proves that you know really if you can do trigonometry you knew how to do it all along like is, is that what he's kind of trying to argue against which is a view I think Leibniz sort of defends but also doesn't yeah, it, well, I think yes to all of that, including all of the qualifications that maybe he doesn't really believe in, whatever. Yeah, I mean, it is like, um, I mean, Locke basically like tries to pin this down and claim that it would have to mean that you remember them, that whenever you think of them later, you remember having known them before. Now, of course, like even if you take Plato literally, which you shouldn't, but even if you take Plato's Socrates literally in the Mino and other dialogues where he talks about reminiscence or the, you know, um, it doesn't mean you actually remember the time when your soul learned them in the realm of the forms, right? If you, um, you had to drink from the river of Luffy before you were born, and so you don't remember that. Yeah. Well, anyway, <laughs> um, uh, but and of course, Leibniz doesn't mean that either. Uh, moreover, Leibniz doesn't exactly believe that we were ever born. <laughs> so, uh, in, in any case, as I said, it's not clear exactly who he's arguing with. The view is is worth discussing because Locke is arguing with it, and so like even if no one actually held it, that's that's what he's talking about. Okay, so but the reason I'm mentioning this now in this context is that um, so the organization of the essay is that it has four books and. Book one is Locke's case against the competing innate principle view. And books two to four are Locke's case in favor of his own empiricist view. Um, Locke says actually that really the burden of proof should be on the innate principle people in the sense that he says, if I can show how we could come to know these things by experience, then the then innate principles serve no purpose and there's no reason to even talk about it. But nevertheless, being the kind of arguer that he is, he always beats every argument to the ground as many ways as possible, right? So he starts off by saying, this couldn't be true and moreover, this is true. Um, 
So what that means is, um, confusingly, that Locke says a lot about principles and about knowledge, right? Which both of which are kinds of propositions. I mean, principles themselves would be examples of knowledge, right? And then other knowledge might be deduced from them. That's all consistent propositions. He says a lot about principles before he talks about ideas, what ideas are and what their relationship to their objects is. So with some trepidation, I'm going to, um, oh boy. I see I'm exactly as far behind as I was last time I gave this lecture. <laughs> well, we'll see what happens. Anyway, <laughs> um, I'm going to discuss them in the opposite order. So that means I may not get to talking about innate principles until, like, I may have to put that off till next lot time, and then everything will get knocked off schedule. But I just think it's really hard to even talk about this without first explaining what Locke thinks an idea is. Okay. So what are ideas? So an idea, let me solve this. An idea is the immediate object of a mental operation. This is in that one section of chapter one. By the way, I should have, should have mentioned this before. Um, there are different ways of numbering the chapters in different editions. The edition I ordered and the editions published in Locke's lifetime called the Introduction Chapter One of Book One. And, and then Book One has four chapters. But in some later editions, the introduction doesn't have a number, and book one has three chapters. So if you were using a different one, you might have uh, got confused by that. I hope that didn't happen in one. Anyway, um, so from chapter one, that is the introduction, I assigned only. this one little piece and oops. this is the definition of idea Whatsoever is the object of the understanding when a man thinks. Um, but uh, <laughs> um, so objects. of a mental operation. And I've added this word, which Locke himself adds later when he's more precise about this. It's the immediate object of a mental operation. So what does that mean? Uh, by the way, this guy on the cover of the book is not Locke. I don't know why this picture is on the cover of the book, <laughs> but it is. All right, um, it's some random other book. <laughs> All right, um, the picture on the course website also is not Locke, but it's a uh, Dolly's attempt to draw Locke, which did pretty well, actually. All right, anyway, um, so what does this mean, the objects of a mental operation? So, 
Okay, there's like, this is a general piece of about how people think the mind works, but not just the mind, things in general. Um, how Aristotelians and early modern philosophers think. So there are substances or things of various kinds. And for example, here's one, fire. And fire has some certain powers or faculties. Potency, capability, right? There's various words you can find here. They're all essentially alternate translations of the Greek word dunamis. Um, so in any case, um, fire has certain powers, potentialities, potencies. Um, for example, it has the power to heat. And let me say it has the power to heat water. So that's a faculty of fire or a power of fire. Now, why is it a power or faculty? It's something that it has even when it's not actually heating water, right? So like the fire is here, there's no water around it. So it's not heating any water, but it still has the power to heat water. But then suppose you bring some water here. Now, as they say, the potency is reduced to act. <laughs> this is the act or operation. So this is the power to heat water. And this is the act or operation of heating water. Right, so when the faculty is, is actually, right, so act here doesn't mean doing something. It's not active as opposed to passive. And in fact, I'm about to talk about passive faculties whose acts are passive, right? So it's not act active as opposed to passive, it's actual as opposed to potential, right? So the operation is when the faculty is in act, when it's actually doing, when the, when the fire is actually doing what it has a power to do. That's when there's an operation of the faculty. And this is an active faculty, but corresponding to it in the water, there's a passive faculty. Right, so I guess I have to draw the water farther away. Right, the water has a potency, potential, power, faculty. Of being heated. Right, again, when, when the water is not near fire and it's not being heated, it still has the power to be heated. But when you bring the fire near the water, again, this potency is reduced to act. So these two things correspond to each other somehow, but I'm not gonna be talking about that so much. Like Galen says a lot about that, but never mind, I'm not. <laughs> So we have here we have an act or operation of the passive faculty. So it's the act of being heated, or maybe the act of being hot. Um, or maybe either one, depending on how you look at it. Anyway, um, right? So so far we're not talking about the mind at all. We're just like things in general have powers or faculties. And uh, that is, they potentially do or undergo certain things. And then sometimes those powers are actualized, meaning that they actually do or undergo those things. And, you know, I've drawn these powers as if they were separate, like, kind of little things inside the big thing. 
Um, but as we'll see, um, the question of when exactly there actually are separate things corresponding to the to the to a power um, is like that's one of the main questions between nominalism and realism, and it's going to be really important to lock when he thinks there is and when he thinks there isn't. Okay, so um, so like at least sometimes this is just a way of talking about the one thing, the fire. When you say it has a faculty of heating, you just mean that this one thing, the fire, could be heating something. Now it's not. Right. Okay, but now, so the mind also has faculties. Um, that is, it has the power or potentiality or capability to do certain things or to undergo certain things. I mean, both, right? Locke is going to say it has both active and passive faculties. Now, I mean, whether the mind is a separate substance, whether it's something distinct from the body, um, Locke actually says, I didn't assign this part of the introduction, but he actually says that he's not going to talk about that in this book. It doesn't matter for his purposes. Um, and when he does bring it up a few times, it's going to be mostly in the context of where it's showing actually how little it matters compared to what you might have thought. He thinks that not much turns on this action. But in any case, he's not going to get involved in that in this book. So maybe the mind is just a feature of the body or something, or maybe it's a separate thing that's connected to the body somehow. I think Locke thinks the second alternative is more likely, but he's anyway, he's not going to argue for it. It doesn't matter because all we need to know about this, whatever it is, is that it has certain powers or faculties. So like one power it has is the power of sensation. Faculty of sensation. So you can see Matt was asking, does a faculty mean an organ? Well, um, um, it might, <laughs> right? That is, again, it might be that there's some particular part of the body that by virtue of which the mind has this faculty, but um, Locke isn't interested in that in this book. He is interested in the fact that I can't exercise this faculty unless my actual sense organs are in working order. Or I don't think he thinks the faculty itself is the sense organ, but that doesn't mean it isn't some part of the brain, let's say, right? Um, but uh, so, you know, what matters here is that somehow the mind is able to carry out a certain kind of act. What kind of act is it? Well, let's say, let me put a body over here. Let's say this is a snowball. So first of all, the snowball has certain faculties of its own. Let's say, for example, the faculty of, or power Locke uses, I, I'm going to stop using faculty so much because Locke mostly uses the word power. And he actually at one point says he thinks the word faculty can be misleading. So the snowball has, for example, the power to look white. So, uh, of course, when no one's looking at it or when it's dark or whatever, it doesn't actually look white, but it still has the power to look white. This power to look white is what Locke is going to call a quality of the snowball. Right? So, like, its quality of whiteness is its power to look white.
Now, when this power is in act, the snowball causes something to happen in my mind. It causes it, of course, by way of light rays and going through the air and something that happens in my eye and my optic nerve and whatever, but um, but somehow by means of that chain, it causes something to happen in my mind. And what it causes to happen to my mind is that this power of sensation passes into act. And now there's an operation. So this is the operation of looking right. And this is the operation of sensing white. So this is a passive faculty, the faculty of sensation, right? It's something that happens to me. Like the snowball makes my mind go into this state of sensing white. Um, okay. So there have been, uh, let's see, a couple of questions since I looked at this. For Locke, are speculative principles metaphysical truths and practical principles moral truths? Yes. I mean, if I get to talk about the innate principles at the end of this lecture, which I'm still hoping I might, <laughs> um, although it's not looking good, um, the, uh, yeah, so he divides the principles into speculative and practical. And as I said last time, speculative is just the Latin equivalent of theoretical. So he's divided them into theoretical and practical. And the, the theoretical innate principles would be metaphysical, logical, some, something like that principles, right? Like the example he keeps, the examples he keeps giving are, it is impossible for the same thing to be and not to be, or whatever is, is. <laughs> those are supposed to be, those are, right? Locke thinks there are no innate principles, theoretical or practical. Those are supposed to be examples of what his opponents think are innate speculative principles. Whereas innate practical principles would be, yeah, would be innate moral principles. And also the same question, is it fine to use, is it fine to read the use of wanting here as something like lacking? Yes, usually in this period in English, to want means to lack. I'm not sure it doesn't ever mean what we mean by want, but it certainly often or 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 usually means to lack something. Um, there's a lot of little changes like that between Locke's English and our our English. I'll, I'll, sometimes I'll point them out. There's also there's notes in the back of this book that sometimes tell you what words mean. Um, so it's worth checking, uh, especially if something doesn't sound right, to see if they have a note on it back here. Um, okay, and now, not the pituitary gland, it was the pineal gland in, in Descartes, not the pituitary gland. But uh, um, unless those are the same thing, I don't think they are. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> um, uh, but no, again, Locke isn't going to say anything about how the brain works and how it's related to what goes on in the mind. He, he says, that's not my business in this book. All right. Um,
Philosophers should be banned from writing about glands. Leave it to the endocrinologists. Well, I mean, he was a physician. There were no endocrinologists yet, but he was as close as he could come. All right. Anyway. Uh, okay. And right. Okay. So back to this. <laughs> um, Right, so so far, this is just like fire heating water. Maybe it's confusing that I drew them in the opposite way, but right, the snowball is like the fire, and my mind is like the water. The snowball has the power to make me sense white, and when you bring the snowball into the right situation, it will actually make me sense white. And meanwhile, I have the power to be made to sense white, and when you bring the, me into the right situation, I will actually sense white. Okay, but these operations are a weird kind of thing. They're a weird kind of operation because they're about something. Right, so like, I mean, you could kind of say that the power of fire to heat water is about water. Um, but we don't, and I think Thomas Aquinas actually says that somewhere. But we don't usually say that. Um, even if you did say that, it wouldn't really be exactly the same kind of relationship we're talking about here. So, but I won't go into that. But, but these mental operations have something they're about. This is the operation of sensing something. The something it senses is called its object. But now I'm going to redraw this in another way. Wait, so here's the mind. Here's the operation of sensation. It points to something outside of itself. It refers to something. That, and that thing that it refers to is called its object. Right? So I talk about this in almost every course. So like, especially if you just had 100B and you're also taking 100, 106, then you're just, this will be the third time you've heard about it probably. Or, Actually, I guess I didn't get to it yet in 106, but right, so object, um, this is the original use of the term object, right? It's not a synonym for thing or being. That's how we use it now, right? Or it's like one of the main ways we use it now, right? So I'm like, you know, what is that object you have over there? How many objects are in this bag? You know, whatever, right? Um, but uh, but the original use of it was relative, and an object is the object of something. So we still use it that way when you say, like, the object of a desire or the object of a plan, right? It's that kind of use of object. So the object of the sensation is what the sensation is of or about. And according to Locke, and this is called the double object theory, <laughs> these mental operations have two objects. There's an immediate object, and the immediate object is an idea. And then, there's a immediate object. So what is the immediate object? So, so in our case of looking at a snowball and seeing white, the immediate object is the idea white. What's the immediate object? Well, sometimes Locke and we might say the immediate object is the snowball.
right? What I'm sensing is the snowball. But the theory here is that I sense it by way of this other thing, the idea, right? So I don't sense the snowball directly. I sense the idea that somehow stands for the snowball. And the snowball, right? So these dotted lines here are reference. The operation refers to is about this immediate object, the idea, and the idea refers to or is about something external. And I was just developing the answer that that external thing is the snowball. And this line here is causation. The snowball causes me, causes my mind to carry out this operation in which I perceive this idea. So the snowball causes me to perceive the idea that stands for it. So anyway, like you could say the immediate object is the snowball. You could say the immediate object is the snowball's quality of whiteness. And sometimes Locke says that. Or you could say the immediate object is the snowball's operation of looking white. Um, and I don't know if Locke ever says that about external objects, although he could. So like, it doesn't make much difference. One, right, this, these are all aspects of the same thing, right? And all, of, all three of these could also be described as the cause of my sensation, right? It's the snowball that causes my sensation, but it causes it because it has the power to look white. And when it actually causes it, it's because that power is in act and it's actually causing me to see white. That is to see the idea of white. I mean, you can call this white, and you can also call this white, but they're not white in the same sense. This is called white because it's the power to cause me to perceive this. Okay, I see Matt has his hand up. Do you have a question? Yeah, I'm a little confused. To me, it seems like I'm getting the definitions mixed up where it appears that the immediate object is similar to Kant's phenomena, and then the immediate object is the phenomena where we can't access the immediate object except through, we can get close to only through the immediate object of the things that are, we experience of the immediate object. Um, well, uh, yeah, um, I think that this immediate object is actually exactly what Kant means by phenomenon. <laughs> and in fact, I think he's um, in part, I mean, it's complicated. Kant is, is trying to put Locke and Leibniz and others together in a way that you know, corrects the mistake and what, you know, but, but I think among other things, he's actually thinking of this picture in Locke when he, when he explains what a phenomenon is. This is not a noumenon because a noumenon is not sensible. And a noumenon doesn't cause anything in me. Or in any case, for theoretical purposes, I can't think of a noumenon as causing because the concept of cause and effect, according to Kant, only applies to phenomena. All right, but that's really, that's a discussion for 106. So, um, um, all right. Are there other questions before I go on? Okay, so the mind obviously has lots of powers, right? Besides just the power of sensation and Locke is gonna describe lots of powers or faculties that the mind has, but um, he divides them all as many philosophers do into two or classifies them under two main powers, right? The power of thought and the power of volition or will.
So, um, this obviously is related to the distinction between theoretical and practical. Right, the power of thought is our power for of using the mind for theoretical purposes, and the power of volition or will is the power to use the mind for practical purposes, something like that. Um, so since sensation is um, um, Is that possibly for pain and pleasure? It's a little confusing what Locke thinks about those. But since sensation is basically for something we have for theoretical purposes, sensation Locke counts as a kind of thought. Belongs to the overall faculty of thought. Um, that's just a terminological point. Locke actually apologizes and says this isn't the proper use of the English word thought, but that's what I'm going to say. <laughs> so, um, um, right, so sensation is a kind of thought, and moreover, it's the uh, first kind of thought. It supplies all the material that thought works with. And so the power of thought, which all our knowledge and rational opinion is also going to be, you know, that's all going to be a function of the power of thought. Um, it starts with sensation. And um, from that, we're going to build up everything else. Maybe I should draw this the other way. Um, so you might think the answer to the question, what is the basis of all our knowledge, would be sensation. However, Locke's actual answer is experience. And experience has this other part besides sensation, which is called reflection. So what is reflection? Reflection is something like a sensation of our own mind. Let me switch to the document camera again. This is book two, chapter one, section four on page This source of ideas, here he's talking about reflection, every man has wholly in himself. And though it be not sense, as having nothing to do with external objects, yet it is very like it, and might properly enough be called internal sense. Right, so in addition to external sense, we have internal sense. Now, um, so, um, how does that work? Well, let me draw a picture of it. Well, maybe I shouldn't have erased the last picture. So let's say, um, and the reason I said we start with sensation is that you always have to have that first before reflection can happen. So at some point, I have a sensation. This is the operation of sensation. Uh, 
of course, the operation of sensation is the operation of seeing, that is, well, of perceiving some idea, for example, the idea white. But the operation of sensation also has another effect. It has an effect on my own mind. I mean, actually, I should say that it's, you know, in this respect, it's passive, right? Like something makes it happen. But in this respect, it's active, in fact. It makes something else happen in my mind. So this is a faculty of sensation. Yeah. And this is the faculty of reflection. And this operation or act of sensation can make me carry out or undergo an act of reflection, an operation of reflection. I guess, therefore, I should draw this as a solid line to be consistent with the diagram I had before, which I now erased. Right? This is causation. And as a result, it works just like external sense. This operation of reflection has an immediate object, which is an idea. What idea is it in this case? Well, it's the idea of sensation. And this is its immediate object. And its immediate object is, well, again, you could say its immediate object is my own mind, right? That is what I'm, so to speak, sensing here is my own mind. Or you could say its immediate object is the faculty of sensation. Or you could say, and in this case, and there must be a reason for this difference, but I don't know what it is. So I'm missing something. But in any case, in this case, Locke will mostly say that this immediate object is the operation. Right? So he says sensation is um, the, uh, um, in sensation, I perceive the ideas of external objects. And in reflection, I perceive the ideas of the operations of my own mind. But at least what I'm claiming is, in either case, he really could say it's the operation, or he could say it's the underlying thing that has the power, or he could say it's the power. Um, the main point that, that I need to make here is this, that this reflection really does work the same way as sensation. Right? So this was the snowball. Just as in the case of sensation, there's an immediate object, which is an idea, and there's an immediate object, which is an external thing, and the external thing causes me to perceive the idea. And by my act of sensation being about the idea, it can, in an immediate way, be about the external object. Similarly, in the case of reflection, the original act I'm ref or operation I'm reflecting on causes me to reflect. And that act of reflection has an immediate object, which is an idea. And in this case, it's so this idea, this is the idea of white. This is the idea of sensation. And by means of this idea of sensation, I can uh, my act of reflection can be about the operation of my own mind.
Okay. So, um, Now, the operation of reflection doesn't have to be about sensation. It can be about any operation of my mind. In particular, I get the idea of reflection by reflecting on my previous operations of reflection. Um, uh, but sensation has to come first, Locke says. So that's why I put sensation at the bottom and reflection on top. But what these have in common is that we get new ideas from. Now, I have to make that more precise, but let me just stop to make sure there aren't more questions. Okay, so to make that more, more precise, I have to start talking about the classification of ideas, which Locke starts in this section, and most of book two is going to be, or all of book two, I guess, is going to be about the classification of ideas. Um, can I erase that? I guess I'm going to erase it. You may regret it. So there's two main ways that Locke classifies, classifies ideas. And there's a bunch of others that come at the end of book two, but these are the important ones. So um, ideas can be classified as simple or complex, and they can be classified as particular or abstract. So the easier distinction to understand is this one. I'm going to talk about this one first. Maybe I'll try to go through this one quickly. Who knows? Maybe we'll still get to talk about innate principles. Never know. All right. So, oh, but first, Matt, do you have your hand up again? Yeah, I have a quick question. Um, so Locke uses this idea that innate uh, principles, uh, like he uses this term that we brought it into reality, whereas for in the case of Descartes, he didn't really bring in his proposition for Guido and so I kind of realized it. Do you know? Yeah, I couldn't hear that. I couldn't hear everything you said. Yes. Yeah. I'm in a I'm in a really loud I'm in a really loud now, sorry. I'll just I'll I'll not take it. Um so Locke says But yeah, I couldn't hear well enough to answer. Maybe if you type it in the chat. But I think you were saying something about what Locke means by innate principle versus what Descartes means by it. Uh, I think you would be right to say that they don't mean the same thing by it. Um, I, I think Locke may think that, I mean, remember, Locke was. Um, in some sense, a great admirer of Descartes, um, and certainly knew what Descartes said. Uh, but I think uh, Locke may find it impossible to make sense of what Descartes means by it, and maybe substituting something that makes more sense to him, which is a thing that philosophers always do to each other, and it's. You're kind of doing a favor <laughs> by by finding something not absurd that's close to the position that your predecessor is expressing and engaging with that. Um, but I don't know. Anyway, um, let me go back to this. So simple versus complex. So you know, like so take the idea of snowball. Now, I mean, that's a little ambiguous. Do I mean the idea of a snowball in general, which would be an abstract idea, or do I mean an idea of some particular snowball? Um, 
but it doesn't matter that much because either way, this is going to be the same result here. A snowball is uh, not something that's just something that's white. A snowball has to be round and cold and has to have a lot of other um, properties. Right? So a uh, complex idea is an idea that includes a lot of different um, characteristics, um, marks, properties that its object has to have. Right? So you, like, so a complex idea might be formed out of white, round and cold. I mean, uh, um, obviously this isn't sufficient to define the concept or the idea of a snowball uh, because this would apply to a cotton ball that I put in the freezer or whatever. But, you know, anyway, assume we have this concept, it consists of other concepts, white, round, and cold. But Locke thinks, so you can divide this concept into simpler concepts. Now, I mean, Locke thinks that some concepts are much more comp complex than others. Um, and uh, although he doesn't talk about this very much, when he does talk about it, he, I think he says pretty clearly that there can be different levels of complexity. Right, so that an, a complex idea can itself be composed of complex ideas. So each one of the ideas that's in it is itself complex. But Locke thinks like you can't continue that process of division forever. Eventually, you're going to get down to ideas that contain only one characteristic and they can't be further divided. And um, those are what's called simple ideas. So round is a little complicated, but white and cold are definitely supposed to be examples of simple ideas according to Locke. White is one of his most common examples of a simple idea. Okay, so that's the simple versus complex distinction. Um, now, as I said, this one's a little bit harder to understand. I'm going to talk about it more later when we get to Locke's discussion of the mental operation of abstraction and how it works. Um, but um, as I said, it's roughly speaking like the distinction between the idea of this snowball here and the idea of snowballs in general. So a particular idea has um, exactly one object that it's about, whereas a general or abstract idea, he sometimes calls them general abstract ideas or general or abstract ideas, um, uh, really the opposite of particular should be universal and the ob opposite of abstract should be concrete. So this whole distinction is a little weird, but in any case, the abstract or general idea is an idea to which many different objects could conform. So I can use it to think about this snowball or about this snowball or about snowballs in general. So, There's a problem about this, and I'll get back to it in more detail later, but I just want to re read the two passages that cause the problem. So on the one hand, um, I don't 
don't have both passages written down there. I'll just say, on the one hand, in book one uh, and in other places, it's pretty clear that according to Locke, we get uh, particular ideas first, right? So infants have only particular ideas. And actually he says non-human animals always only have particular ideas. And then at some point in our development, we, get, we start gaining the ability to form abstract ideas. And we'll see, according to him, that's crucial to the ability to use language and whatever. It's very important. But the main point here is that particular ideas come first. Right? But he also says at the beginning of book two, So here's two things. One is on page 109, the beginning of section, book two, uh, chapter one, section three. Our senses can first, our senses conversant about particular sensible objects do convey into the mind several distinct perceptions of things according to those various ways wherein those objects do affect them. And thus we come by those ideas we have of yellow, white, heat, cold, soft, hard, bitter, sweet. Those are all or mostly simple ideas. In fact, I guess I should have said this is probably the most important thing and I almost skipped saying it. So um, when Locke says all our knowledge is based on experience, and so that is when Locke says I'm an empiricist, what he means, strictly speaking, is that the mind can't form new simple ideas, that it can only get simple ideas through its passive faculties of sensation and reflection. Right? So once I have simple ideas, I can put them together in new ways, right? So like I've seen a, a cotton ball and felt an ice cube, I could form the idea of something that's cold and white, even though I might never have encountered one. But I can't form the idea of white if I've never seen something white. So that's the empiricism. Right? Like that's all the empiricism right there, basically. All our ideas have to come from experience because they're all made up of simple pieces and the simple pieces have to come from experience. We can't make them. All right, anyway, so right, so here he's saying that the senses let in these simple ideas. And I think he's even more clear about this at the beginning of chapter two on page 121. And this is going to be really important, especially for trying to understand exactly what Locke and Barclay disagree about. Because the disagreement in this area is that Barclay says we have no abstract ideas. The other disagreement is that Barclay says there is no immediate object. That is, there are no bodies, <laughs> right? But anyway, so getting, so getting back to Locke here, Though the qualities that affect our senses are in the things themselves so united and blended, there is no separation, no distance between them. Yet tis plain the ideas they produce in the mind enter by the senses simple and unmixed. Right, so like in the snowball, for example, in the snowball, the white and the cold, the whiteness and the coldness are not separated. You can't take the whiteness out and, and like leave the coldness in or like take them apart from each other. They're, um, they're completely blended and mixed. And they're even, they're both due to the same fact about the snowball, right? They're both due to the fact that a snowball is made out of tiny pieces of ice. 
Um, but they enter the mind simple and unmixed. So what does that mean? Well, like, first of all, this is saying the mind doesn't separate these ideas out from each other. They enter the mind simple and unmixed. What does the separation? Well, it's our sense organs, right? So like, this is what a sense organ is. A sense organ is a sensitive detector that responds only to some qualities of an object and not to others, right? So like the cold sensing organ in my skin will, I can change the color of the snowball as much as I want and it won't change what that organ does. But if I change the temperature, that organ reacts. And on the other hand, my eye, of course, I can change the temperature as much as I want and it won't affect what my eye does. But if I change the color, it will affect my what my eye does. So this, so these ideas are separated from each other, so to speak, by the sense organs before they even arrive in the mind. And the question is going to be this. So if what I first get from the object is simple ideas, aren't those actually really abstract? Right? Like the idea of whiteness by itself seemingly applies to every white thing ever. It's one of the most abstract ideas you could have. So which is it, Locke? Which do we get first? Simple ideas or particular ideas? This seems to be a contradiction. OK, so I mean, that's going to be both a clue to what Locke really, the way Locke really thinks abstraction works, and also a clue to what Barclay and Locke actually disagree about. Um, <laughs> I'll talk about Hegel later, don't worry. <laughs> Not today. Um, right, and Matt says, so honey is a complex idea because it can be divided into sweet, yellow, sticky, etc. whereas the idea of sweet is simple. Yes, exactly. Okay, so I do have about five minutes left to start talking about innate principles, but maybe I should instead pause for questions again. Oh, Enoch asked, what would be the difference between a complex idea and a proposition? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, that's too hard. I can't answer. <laughs> uh, well, a complex idea is neither true nor false. Right? Snowball. Is that true or false? Doesn't claim anything. So, um, um, but something white is also cold. That's a proposition. There are snowballs, it's true, and if there are no snowballs, might be false. Um, okay, but you could ask me about the proposition, this snowball exists, um, but I'm not ready to talk about that. Now. <laughs> but I think according to Locke, that also involves a subject and a predicate. Yes, Josephine. So when he talks, this is something that kind of confused me in the reading. When he talks about ideas enter the mind unmixed, um, it's kind of like unclear. I guess my question is to, like I wouldn't think of ideas entering the mind, right? I think of ideas as being in the mind. So to what extent does he make a distinction between the coldness, which is a thing that the snowball has, 
and my idea of the coldness. Like, are ideas a thing that I make in my mind, or are they th a thing that enters the mind from the world? Like, I guess, I guess my question is, uh, would he would he say that coldness is a a, a an existent quality, like an accident? In is what Aristotle would call it, or is he saying that like coldness is an idea that zips into your head when you look at stuff okay so, like, so so the simple answer is that he and as i made a distinction i i tried to make a distinction in my picture that he very much very wants to distinguish picture. between the between the idea and the quality of the object so the quality in the object is again is a power of the object and it's the power to cause me to perceive this idea. So these are not at all the same thing. He does apologize. So first of all, like the term white can be ambiguous or whiteness. This could be called whiteness. This could be called whiteness. Um, I think... Locke thinks that this is the primary sense of the word white. It, well, actually, like, in some sense, as we'll see when we get to book three, he thinks that, that, that a word can only stand for an idea. <laughs> right? A word can only immediately stand for an idea. But um, but in any case, right? So so no, these are not the same. However, it's true that he sometimes talks about like as if the idea of white came out of the snowball and came into my mind. But um, um, I think that's just a matter of speech. Um, that doesn't resolve the question of where does this idea come from? Then, if it doesn't, it's. It's not something that floated out of the snowball and landed in my mind somehow. Where, what is it? Where did it come from? Um, like, it has to exist when this operation exists. But what makes sure it's there? So, like, he doesn't talk about that. I think that probably also belongs to the... Um, like, for example, if the mind is an aspect of the body, then that explanation would have to do with animal spirits flowing around and stuff. If the mind is an immaterial substance, it would have to do with whatever goes on in immaterial substances. <laughs> um, so, uh, um, so I think he's not really answering that. What this actually is, and, you know, um, but... Uh, but for our purposes, all that's necessary is that is to know that this is like by definition, whatever our operation of sensation is immediately about. I hope people understand what immediate means now. I usually get a little thing about that, and I didn't this year, but right? Immediate means that there's nothing in between. There's not, there's no medium or there's nothing mediating, right? So this is the immediate object. So like no what in between, meaning there's like, um, um, no object in between. This is immediate object because there's another object in between this object and my mind. But this is an immediate object because there's no other object in between. Even though there's all kinds of stuff in between me. It, well, actually, no, not necessarily between me and this idea. I should say that. There's all kinds of stuff in between me and the snowball, right? But those things don't count, like the air or whatever, because those aren't objects of my sensation at all. We're just asking, you know, is there another object in between or not? Um, okay, well, so we, I mean, we're actually past time, but we have something quick. <laughs> oh, well, well, we can see. But in terms of like the immediate object, right, the idea of the immediate object, 
is it only created through the perception of an individual or is can it be created through group perception like is there any ideas in Locke about the mind as like is the mind always the mind of an individual or could there be is like their group sensation or group perception or group creation of ideas I think Locke never yeah I think Locke thinks that every mind is an individual mind every yeah Okay, that cool. So it was quick. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, and on that note, so I didn't get to innate principles after all, and I will have to talk about it next time. And uh, uh, and did I say, I didn't remember, I don't think I said this at the beginning, but, oh no, maybe I did. I'll just say it one more time then. Anyway, I don't know yet. I'm hoping we'll be back. I'll be back in Santa Cruz in person next week, and I will let you know certainly over the weekend, if not sooner. Okay. And so one way or another, I'll see you next week. Okay. Bye.